Hello and welcome to episode four of Skeleton Songs. Forbidden knowledge. Now that took us about 800 tries <laughs> because Alexis has a very bold baritone voice um, and we're trying to get the, the equalising right on this audio. So I hope you all appreciate how much energy went into that first two seconds of your experience. I had to do about episode. five different spooky voices before we found one that didn't overload the mic. Yeah, we think it was spooky. Um, so we thought about doing this episode about disease and plague and then we realised that was a stupid idea because everyone's had enough of disease and plague and we're all cooped up in our houses and we'd rather think about something else. So we are t- talking about forbidden knowledge today, which is rather a specialism. Forbidden <laughs> Yeah, careful. This is rather a specialism of yours, AK. It is. It's, it's um, one of the things that I've... The, the, that I've come back again and again to is I've been I do a lot of text-based games. Think about text-based games; they tend to be quite elusive. You often make the best use of text when you're talking about things that you can't draw outright. Um, and which is why you give me such difficult art directions. Yes, I'm sorry about that. I've, I've, I've uh, over the years <laughs> I've got about four different artists' instructions to to do at least fifteen non-existent colours but one of the uh, one of my art directions at the minute is um, the notion of obscurity so just do a question mark <sighs> there you go <sighs> art direction sorry go on anyway um, so the thing about forbidden knowledge is is from a an authorial point of view it's both difficult and convenient because you uh, so there's two kinds of forbidden knowledge uh, uh, really there's knowledge that's ipso facto dangerous because it drives you mad or it does something even worse to you. And there's knowledge that's dangerous because of what you can do with it and and the consequences that might arise from that. And often the two overlap, of course. So give us an example of of both. Yeah, so uh, the classic example of knowledge that's dangerous because of what you might do with it is uh, good old Dr Faustus. Uh, or uh, or the tragical history of Dr Faustus. Um, In my notes, it is to hot lad doff, which is the... uh, the tale of the history of the life and death of Dr. Faustus, I believe. That or sounds something. Right. But you could just kind of make it up in Elizabethan times. You could be like, oh, it's that play about the guy. And you'd be like, yes, I'm going to see that one. I like the bit with the dog. So I did. Uh, I think my life would be very different um, if I hadn't done the A level texts I did. Um, one was Dr. Faustus uh, and one was The Tempest, uh, and both of which uh, are uh, deal closely with Elizabethan ideas about uh, the occult. Um, and both of which are some of the most quotable plays ever to grace the English language. They're so good. I would like it known as a point of fact that Marlowe is at least the equal of Shakespeare. Putting that out there. I mean, he did die mysteriously early and maybe Shakespeare saw him as a threat. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past Shakey. So the, what I was going to say actually about Marlowe is is a, a lot of folk are aware that there's been persistent rumours about him being a spy. Uh, and these seem to have arisen because... He was excused for absence from college uh, because he had been um, the Privy Council said, or, or the Cambridge uh, Authority said, I forget which, uh, engaged in a business of benefits to the country without specifying what. I mean, that is almost explicit, really, isn't it? Well, yeah, but it might also be that he was tutoring someone important. That's true. Uh, and that might also explain why he seemed to be spending a lot more money than he could um, on a scholarship. Mm. But here's the thing. The reason that he had to excuse himself uh, for his absences is because there were rumours he was going to the English College at Reims in France. And uh, if he had been going there, it could only have been to become a Roman Catholic priest. No! Which, in Elizabethan times... Not Christopher! And there were there, there were rumours about connections uh, between him and Catholicism. I'm not clear if he was a practising Catholic or not all through his life until his untimely death down the road from where we live in in, in Deptford Creek uh, but Roman Catholic doctrine was forbidden knowledge mm. as far as the regime of Queen Elizabeth was concerned and Elizabeth and her um, spy masters were extraordinarily paranoid uh, because they needed to be because um, England uh, was a country ruled by a woman 
unheard Boo. of with a Madness. tenuous claim to the throne. Um, and it was one of the rare non-Catholic countries. And people kept thinking it was going to marry somebody and it would fall into the hands of one of their opponents. So, so there really were constant plots against their life and against the throne. And mm. of course, every other country that was um, thinking of invasion or usurpation was Catholic. So it tends to be associated with papist plotting. And when... You remember the beginning of Faustus, um, Marlowe, uh, Faustus himself rather, does a sort of tour through the different disciplines. Yes, uh, and he says, that's boring, I'm bored of maths, I'm bored of philosophy. Yeah, divinity. I've, I've conquered everything, it's a solved problem. Um, and the only thing left for me, I think, is magic and necromancy. Yes, tis magic, magic that hath raffished me, I think, is the, the phrase. And that's, oh, of so good. course, the thing about forbidden knowledge is it, it's, it's, if, you know, we're monkeys... If you give a monkey a box with a button on it and a sign saying, do not press this button, <laughs> there's only one thing the monkey's going to do. And it's interesting you bring up monkeys because I will come back to that. Oh, really? Remember that, listeners, yeah. But this was uh, Mr. Eaton, the storyline I wrote for Forward London, initially as a sort of a casual joke, then it sort of spiralled out of control. Which we should say for listeners who have not played Lexus Kennedy's entire oeuvre, Forward London is its first game. It's a browser-based RPG set in an alternate spooky version of London, which has been stunned by bats and is full of Victorians doing fun things. Anyway, Go. well, nobody's going to listen to this if they don't. don't. We've got to yeah. shill the product, yeah, that's Bay. That's true. Okay, well, it's not our product anymore. We gotta chill your legacy, Bay. Fair enough. Anyway, um, oh, that's probably too loud. Sorry, folks. I just <laughs> shouted in your ear. Uh, so, forbidden knowledge is is is, is innately appealing, and uh, this is this is one of the things about it. It's it, it, it's seductive, and uh, do you think we'll ever get through a podcast without mentioning Lovecraft at least once? No. Lovecraft, obviously. Um, uh, his whole stock in trade is forbidden knowledge, and that of all the other writers uh, who worked in the mythos, that's the thing. And I said earlier, it's it's both difficult and convenient to have forbidden texts, because you it's very hard to quote bits of it, because inevitably people say, well, that's not that spooky. Mm. It's like if you have a poet in your story who's, who's extraordinarily talented, good luck writing, uh, the output of an extraordinarily talented poet. Well, or, uh, you have or, or to the refer classic to example of, of the horror villain. You know, a lot of people do a lot with shadows and, and suggestion rather than showing you the guy in a scary suit because it might be frightening for some people. But exactly. for some people, they're not arachnophobic or they've, they've seen a guy in a scary leather mask with a chainsaw before. So they're like, eh. Whereas if you say, like, it's the scariest thing ever and leave it to the imagination, then of course, what more fertile soil is there? There's the, the, the quote I keep coming back to, which I've heard attributed to Ian Banks, although um, it, it, it's disputed. Um, to the effect that the the writer has access to the greatest special effects budget ever devised, <laughs> which is the human imagination. And this is the thing about text-based games, is that if you are trying to make a game scary with sound and visuals, you could absolutely do it. I've been terrified and witnessed by, by games and films and visuals and sounds. But you have access to a particular kind of intonation um, and implication mm. uh, with, um, with, with, with text. Um, and I, I noticed when I started looking at this, there's a bunch of tools that keep coming up. So one of the ones, one of the ones that I've used all the time, is that if you are lucky enough to work in a game mechanical framework, you can use game mechanics to emphasise how freaking scary the secret is. So in Ford in London, you start out with whispered secrets, and then it goes up to cryptic clues and appalling secrets, and there's a hierarchical taxonomy until you get up to, all the way up to, I think, searing enigmas. And it's never clear what these things actually contain or are. They're used interchangeably. But the fact that a searing enigma sells for an awful lot more than whispered secret and can be used to unlock certain things gives us a certain gravitas you don't get just from the, the image of a flame. And the same thing, of course, with Cultist Simulator, that you get... Um, uh, seven or eight different levels of, of, of law from like hinting fragments all the way up to the names of, of, of major entities. So uh, that that's one of the approaches, but obviously Lovecraft couldn't do that. And obviously you do a lot of work with evocative titles and you do a lot of work by using languages that are not necessarily um, immediately comprehensible to people who are reading it. So good example, cult de goule. Uh, it's French, <laughs> so it sounds uh, fancy if yep. you're an English speaker, yep. because the French sound fancy to us. And, oui. <laughs> and um, 
so that, that's one one end. Another thing is the intertextuality. So there's a couple of things that crop up here. One is that once you've got a book referenced, you can use it in other places and people can feel the pleasure of nodding knowingly and recognising, mm. oh, yeah, that thing, that's, that's dangerous. And the other thing is that um, that, that's often used across stories. One of the hallmarks of mythos work is that everybody, you know, Block and Derleth all the way up to the present day, people like Ramsey Gamble, um, is he still writing? Anyway, but but um, decades of people uh, can reference those books and participate in the mythos. And I it, listen to a lot of um, Lovecraft audiobooks, and the, the phrase that particularly sticks out in my mind forever is the constant re- re- uh, reference to um, the cursed Necronomicon by the mad Arab um, Alazine. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, exactly a, a, a made up Arab name uh, and the phrase the mad Arab uh, rings rather less. Uh, clearly in... well I actually have a, have a point to make because again that's something that I'm going to talk about when we talk about mm. my uh, chosen text for today's um, episode but but I think it's worth stating because obviously there are a bunch of um, worldviews expressed by gothic literature that we no longer <laughs> agree with which is fine um, but I think it's very important that we recognise that firstly that doesn't um, negate any other interesting creative aspects of the work so just mm. because somebody said something that we no longer think is a cool thing to say um, we, we shouldn't just discard the entire work Firstly, mm-hmm. and secondly, I think it's important to recognise that within Gothic literature specifically, there are a couple of tropes at play here that are not just basically racist and a bit weird. Yeah. So there's the concept of the other, which is why we want to reference something outside of the reader's common knowledge. So we want to say it's from France or it's from um, Arabia or it's from the East, because a lot of the readers will think, "Oh, that's interesting. I don't know anything about that," and therefore be more open to thinking, "Yes, this is a magic mm. kind of forbidden text that I haven't heard of." Whereas if you say it was, you know, Mrs. Thrum's diary, then everyone's like, "Well, she doesn't sound very spooky because I live next to someone called Mrs. Thrum." Um, there's also uh, Orientalism, which is for our favour again, but but at the time was not just about saying, look over there at those funny people doing strange things. It was actually a lot of excitement about this opening um, and burgeoning understanding of the East in the Western consciousness. So it's not as simple as just saying a bunch of people said some stuff that now we think is racist. I think actually there's a lot of interesting um, framing stuff going on within these stories. But I'll get off my soapbox now and back to you. I think I think it's um, since since you mentioned Lovecraft, uh, I I read when I was writing that piece on my influences the other day um, a really entertaining column in a Jewish magazine tablet I think um, called uh, it's a regular it's column so called good. Antisemites We Love <laughs> uh, and, and the subtitle you know people who hate us but we still think are interesting. <laughs> Uh, it's the coolest I, thing ever. I, I, I recommend it. But, I mean, forbidden knowledge, I think, you know, there's a meta thing. But what I was going to say is, is a lot of these invented books, because you, you can do a couple of things. You you, you can reference real-world occult authors. Um, I've got a reference to Robert Flood, F-L-U-D-D, in um, Cultist. Uh, but you, you tend to run out of road fairly quickly because those are obviously the authors everyone else shares. There are only so many real world occult authors. So what people often did was make up names that are often quite silly jokes. So the <laughs> Kurt de Gaulle, yeah. the author is the Comte d'Elet. I don't understand. August d'Elet. Ah! And it wasn't. It wasn't actually Lovecraft I, who, um, who invented it. It was, uh, I think, Robert Bloch. When I was looking at it earlier. Um, and apparently Derleth actually claimed to have invented it later and there was some dispute about it but Lovecraft really liked it and he used it in his stories in turn and, and this is the way these things get, get passed around The King in Yellow I think is probably the most celebrated and delightful horrible example I still need to read that I'm the, embarrassed to say that I basically came to it via True Detective well that, so that's, that's the thing there's this fantastic lineage of The King in Yellow Carcosa and um, The Lake of Harley or Harley is a, a proper name were names used in an Ambrose Bierce short story in the 1880s, an inhabitant of Carcosa, which is definitely Gothic, but is in, in, in no way Lovecraftian. And Robert Chambers, who wrote the short story The King in Yellow and used The King in Yellow in a bunch of um, his other short stories as, as a concept and reference, he just liked the names Carcosa and Harley mm. and I think Hastur, so he used them. And then a whole bunch of other writers used them, picked up on it, it was the idea of the play that's too dangerous to perform or read um, is uh, obviously very compelling. And uh, one of the things Chambers does brilliantly is use fragments from it. Mm. So you can align, you know, obviously the bits that are off stage are more horrifying or the bits we see are quite scary. Uh, and 
uh, it showed up in a bunch of other people's work and then finally showed up, you know, where a lot of people saw it, in True Detective, and also the Mysterious Package Company, whose services we avail ourselves you of. You do love the Mysterious Package Company. Did a, a, a king in the early package. And I think that's a great example of what you were saying about, um, what you were talking about earlier, that I, for example, have not read The King in Yellow, but I'm aware that when its mm. name is invoked, that what it basically means is this forbidden text that will drive me mad if I see it performed or, or, or delve into it. And that's kind of the power of it. It's not actually about the content. It's kind of transcended what the play itself is, yes. and it's become a sort of reference point for a bunch of other literature and a bunch of other stories. And that's one of the less obvious ways in which, from an authorial point of view, this kind of stuff is useful, because it takes attention away from what the book actually contains. Mm, and what it means instead. Exactly, and the significance in it. So sometimes this is really blatant and quite annoying. Michael Moorcock, who wrote, <laughs> as far as I can tell... You're not a fan, are you? No, I am a fan. I'm are a you? Huge, well, I'm a huge fan, but the thing is, you can be a huge fan of a lot of Michael Moorcock, uh, and still not like a lot of other Michael Moorcock, because he basically yeah. wrote most of the heroic fantasy of the 20th <laughs> century um, before lunch, as far as I can tell. It's insanely productive, very, very varied, very varied in quality. And um, one of his tropes is um, forbidden knowledge, which is snatched away from our uh, explorers or heroes' hands at the last minute. So I think Elric tracks down the Dead Gods book, which contains all the knowledge of previous ages, and obviously when it opens it, it's rotted to dust, and it's the you know it's just the jewels in the cover, but it's full of dust. And and I think nice. I remember reading that as as a teenager, and being like, how have we seen this before? And can we just see what's in the freaking book <laughs> one time? But of course, it's not about no, the book; it's about the quest for, for the knowledge. But I was going to say, um, because I know people will be thinking of this, the idea of forbidden, dangerous knowledge. Once computers and software came into play, and once especially people started thinking of consciousness as analogous to computers, it shows up everywhere in science fiction. Uh, Stevenson and Egan and all sorts. But probably the single most influential example of it uh, was the basilisk. Uh, so Dave Langford, who's a, I think, venerable is, is a fair word. Um, he's, he's, he's an author and a sort of... Um, presence in Fanish culture since since uh, I was a kid. Uh, very, very funny. Um, also wrote some really chilling short stories about the idea of a fractal pattern that can crash the human brain. So if you look at it, you die. And Amazing. one of the nastiest stories you wrote about this concerns a member of an extreme right organisation who started spraying this on walls in places where immigrants Ooh. Ooh. gather. Okay, yeah. that's horrible. Yeah. Uh, and there's also that story, of forgive the couple speak, that we listened to in the car, The 10,000 Names of God by... Yes, let's come back to that, actually, because that's very relevant, but it's 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 the um, knowledge that's dangerous because of what you do with it, rather than... Okay. Yeah. But, um, Clark. Clark. Yeah. Good old Clark. But the thing, so, so, so I'm sure uh, anybody who's any familiarity with the genre stuff would already have thought of a bunch of other mind viruses and, and um, things, but... Um, the nice thing about the Langford idea of the basilisk is a lot of authors recognise the influence and people like Greg Egan and Ken McLeod and um, uh, Charles Stross all have like um, uh, the Langford uh, brain hack and the Langford death parrot. <laughs> really? Yes, as, really as nice. concepts in, in their stories. So it's, it's, it's the modern day successor to the Comte de Lett. And, and all Lovecraft's equally nerdy friends all passing around each other's names, putting in the stories. And my own contribution to this was a tiny, silly one, um, not to, to mythos, but obviously when I wrote Cultist Simulator, a lot of Kickstarter... Which, again, if you haven't played it, we should just say to listeners... It's a game, it's good. It's, oh, my God, this is why I do the marketing. It's not just a game, it's a PC game about Lovecraftian demise and madness and an apocalypse and yearnings and a 1920s alternate kind of reality where you can scratch away the skin of reality and get at the bones of the true world, but it will drive you mad and kill you. All that stuff. Uh, and, right, which is more evocative <laughs> which will make you buy this game uh, so my, my mother actually was one of the Kickstarter backers right um, Good and penny. people have wandered by about the um, book of the white cat uh, which is a story uh, a, a text about a blind white cat that used to whisper secrets to Penelope of Gordium and the reason that's in there is that Penelope is my mother's name and uh, she had a much beloved uh, a glaucomic white <laughs> cat called Matty who died um, during development uh, yeah yeah mm. during the end of development so I, the book of the white cat specifically memorialises my mother's white cat Matty 
But oh. do you want to talk about your chosen text? Yeah, this is somebody that I've mentioned um, in episode one, actually, but I will shut up about him eventually. Um, this is Sheridan Le Fanu again, um, the Irish writer at the end of the 19th century. And I think one of my favourite Gothic stories ever is his short story, Green Tea. Now, this brings about um, the monkey trope and the Orientalist slash othering trope. Um, and I just think it's a really brilliant example of forbidden knowledge in a short Gothic text. So the essential... Um, premise, and I'm, if you don't want to know the, the plot, then skip 10 minutes ahead. Um, it revolves around a uh, English priest called uh, Mr. Yannings, who's a reverend, not a priest, sorry. I don't really know the difference. Um, and he ends up going to see a doctor, Dr. Hesalius, which is a recurring character and motif in Le Fanu's work, and I think in a couple of other kind of mm. occult referential works, because he's kind of like Van Helsing. He's a sort of occult aware medical practitioner who's got a lot of history dealing with this sort of stuff. And um, he has developed this intense kind of nervous um, disorder, which all started four years ago when he was writing um, a tract on religious metaphysics. And he said that very late at night, uh, writing this as a solitary pursuit, and he started off um, drinking black tea while he was working on this, and then he ran out of black tea, and he started drinking green tea. Now, um, this seemed to help him uh, come up with ideas and concepts better than black tea, so he kept drinking, he drank a lot of it. And um, on an omnibus home one night, he <laughs> spots um, on the floor of this empty dark bus these two dots of light, red light. And as he goes up closer to the red lights, he sees they're not lights, but in fact the eyes of a small black monkey that is grinning at him from the floor of this bus. And being an Englishman, he pokes it with his umbrella, which is our first response to everything. <laughs> um, and the umbrella goes straight through but he can still see the monkey. So this obviously really creeps him out. I mean, he's a religious chap, and, and I'm fairly certain that most kind of, certainly domestic forms of Christianity are not pro all the spooky things that you can put an umbrella through. Um, so he gets off at the next stop, but the monkey begins to follow him. And from that point on, the monkey is his constant companion, even though nobody can, can see it other than he. Um, and for the first year or so, the monkey's fairly kind of just there, it's not particularly troublesome. Um, but, you know, it causes this guy some some alarm that he sees this spectral monkey and over time it gets a little bit more malignant um, so it disappears for a bit during which Yannings prays profusely to God to try and make sure he doesn't come back but in fact he does come back and he comes back with a vengeance and he starts doing things like um, sitting on the reverend's bible when he's giving sermons so he can't see the words properly which is a trope that actually Faustus yeah. uses um, the idea that there is some sort of demonic entity stopping you seeing the word in the scripture of God the um, opposite of forbidden knowledge really there well, it's forbidden by devils, and that's another yeah. thing that, that, that Faustus deals with, which I'll come back to after this. But he starts doing that, and then he disappears for three months, and he comes back, and he's really horrible, and he actually starts um, poking Yennings every time he tries to pray, so he's not allowed to pray anymore, he can't do his sermons anymore, and eventually he starts hearing the monkey's voice in his head, and he starts seeing the monkey even when his eyes are closed, which I think is really horrible, because that kind of feels like it's come into him rather than is now mm. external. And the voice in the monkey's head is blasphemous, and it tells him to hurt himself and hurt others. Um, and this is the point at which Yennings, um, Yennings sorry, goes to Dr. Hesalius and says, help. And Hesalius listens to all of this and, and you know, understands it and goes away to come up with a, with a plan of attack. Um, but that night he's called back in an emergency call to the Reverend's house and the Reverend has ultimately cut his own throat. So the story ends in tragedy. Um, and Hesalius uh, recounts it in the framing narrative at the end of the story um, as the process of a poison that excites the reciprocal action of spirit and nerve and paralyzes the tissue that separates those cognate functions of the senses, the external and the interior. Thus we find strange bedfellows and the mortal and immortal prematurely make acquaintance. And I love that characterization mm. because not only is it quite medical, which suits the character and is kind of an interesting take on it, but it implies that there is some sort of inevitability about this realm of the supernatural or the forbidden that has been introduced um, you know, dangerously or prematurely to the individual. And I think that's why we have this kind of strong spiritual and religious link to the occult, certainly in this context, because what we're saying is there is a world after death, there is a world of hell, there is a world of something beyond the mortal realm that we experience in our daily lives. But if you delve too too greedily and too deep, mm. if you uncover that too early or without the proper sanctions by whichever god you happen to believe in, then there will be some sort of Faustian comeuppance. Um, and all of that is in like 20 pages. Not bad. That's that. That's. Did Lefanu have either a, a a drug problem or mental health issues? No, I'm not. I'm not being mean. <laughs> but the the idea of this this monkey that accompanies you and sometimes goes away and sometimes mm. comes back and then it speaks to you. Oh, I didn't even. It does sound like it references. 
a bunch of other stuff. I mean, not to my knowledge. Um, I've never heard about him having a, a, a mental health issue or a drugs problem. Um, the, the major premise that I helpfully missed out of my summary is that the idea that he drank the green tea, this kind of uh, exotic material, opened his inner eye and somehow enabled him to start seeing things that are already there mm. around us that you can't normally engage with rather mm-hmm. than... But then, of course, because it's gothic, it's framed in a, in a kind of slightly ambiguous way of was he going mad? Was this all in his yeah. head? Or was it some kind of external reality that we just can't comprehend because it's really spooky and we haven't drunk green tea? Um, but yeah, he's a complicated guy. But some people think he was rubbish. A lot of the reviews of the books at the time were like, well, he tries, but he's not very adult. I think, I think a lot of really interesting writers... M.R. James liked him. <laughs> uh, well, then I, I trust M.R. James. But, you know, like Lovecraft as well, um, aside from the political angle, his pro style gets a lot of stick. Um, and I think that's unfair, but I can also see why. Well, it's just stylistic, isn't it? It is, it is and, you know, it's sometimes it's like watching a freaking snake getting dressed. It's, it's <laughs> That's a great characterization. But, but sometimes it's it's... Really effective. If anyone hasn't read Lovecraft, he's famously verbose. Um, he he loves using very long words when he doesn't necessarily need to. But if you read any of his stories, the effect is you kind of immerse yourself in this wordy soup and then tone poetry. <laughs> tone poetry, yeah, and then and then yeah, it all it all works very well. And he obviously is brilliant at creating this atmosphere of creeping dread and and boneless flopping things at the doorway, and it's all very spooky. Um, I wanted to I wanted to fit in some nuclear secrets. Are we going to give the listeners? The nuclear codes. I mean, they're, they're they're quite old nuclear secrets. So this is this is this is a couple of anecdotes that um, that uh, tied together rather neatly that I came across in different contexts in the past. And one is that uh, Einstein, uh, who Hooray! you probably know, was a committed pacifist. Nevertheless, was encouraged by one of his um, collaborators, students, Leo Schillard, to. Uh, Right with Shillard to President Roosevelt um, in the uh, first half of the 20th century to say, to express his concern that Nazi Germany might develop a nuclear bomb and to encourage Roosevelt to back research into uh, an American deterrent. And this is one of the things that is credited with kicking off the Manhattan Project. Of course, it's never possible to a trip to understand exactly what went into a decision but certainly the world's most eminent physicist and one of the world's most eminent, eminent pacifists writing to a u.s president you'd listen wouldn't you yeah uh, and einstein in fact had um qualms the rest of his life because obviously he felt he had some uh share in the blame of the development of nuclear weapons and things might have gone differently it's very difficult but, it is what it is, and, and I think um, nuclear secrets are the, the closest thing we've got to real forbidden knowledge um, in the post-industrial era, both because it's been uh, the subject of, of extremely intense intelligence activity and because there is something uncanny about it from a, a sort of lay point of view. I've, because I've, it feels like it's sort of destruction on a totally different scale. And it feels yeah, like because different. because there's this apocalyptic thing and also yeah. because radiation is frightening. There's, you remember yes, the, uh, the New Game Plus thing in Cultist Simulator? Um, I deliberately reference a bunch of nuclear stuff and there's even a reference to Cherenkov radiation in some of the special effects basically that people did pick up on. Uh, and... Yeah, nuclear stuff is frightening. But the other, so the, the, this is what I was saying at the beginning about dangerous to whom, because it it's it might be more dangerous if you if it hadn't been developed. But obviously, it's extremely fucking dangerous. But here's a better example of dangerous to whom. Years on from Einstein writing this letter, of course, the U.S. developed and dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan, killing an enormous number of people. Um, I thought we were going to cheer people up in this current crisis. Uh, are you going to get? Have there? you read my be, work? Going to be a bit with a clown. Uh, clowns, are, clowns are not not good. No, that's true. Them. Clowns are banned. That's correct. But, but so uh, um, this ended the war, one way or another. Hooray! Um, and whether or not it would have, the war would have ended anyway is still the topic of, of debate. But uh, that is what uh, pushed the Japanese emperor at the time to surrender. But the, a lot of the establishment didn't like the idea of surrendering. So Hirohito recorded his surrender speech, which is wonderfully called the Jewel Voice Broadcast, on Japan a phonograph so cool. record. 
Um, and then about a thousand army officers and right wingers broke into the imperial palace, which obviously is not something that ever happened. Yeah. Trying to track down the broadcast and stop, to stop it. it. Being, yeah. But the imperial palace is very crazy. complicated in its layout. And it was dark. So they all bumbled about tripping <laughs> over each other and couldn't find it. And the dual voice broadcast was successfully smuggled out of the palace. According to Wikipedia, um, in a basket of dirty women's underwear. And I went looking for the original source of this, and, and it looks like this may be some slightly original research or assumptions, but certainly it was smuggled out in, in a basket under the noses, um, and it was broadcast, bringing the Second World War to an end, which was a positive outcome. What an amazing human sort of interaction with forbidden knowledge. Right. I wanted, I wanted to... When but what I was going to say, there's two, two things that, that particularly come in here. One is that part of the justification here OED gave for surrendering is he said the enemy have developed this extraordinary new weapon, mm. which if it keeps being used, could lead to the extinction of human civilization. Smart man. And, you know, the noise out of the box had to be stopped. And secondly, the story goes, the dual voice broadcast, the phonograph record still exists, but has never been played since that day. I like that. You're going to say something? Oh, just I, I think it's nice to end um, the podcast on another anecdote about humans interacting, you know, in reality with this forbidden knowledge. And you were talking about um, nuclear codes as, as kind of a great example of modern forbidden knowledge. And one of my favourite facts, which I believe is actually true about um, how the, the British government works, is when we have a new prime minister, one of their first um, acts is to write on a, on a physical piece of paper in a letter um, their orders if we end up in a nuclear apocalyptic situation they are they are meant to write their decision before they are in the context of a nuclear apocalypse about whether or not basically we fire nukes at anybody else or or what we do Um, and they place it in an envelope and that envelope goes in the safe of the admirable of the submarine corps of the navy and it is never opened unless there is a nuclear apocalypse or a nuclear emergency um so so what has happened seeing as fortunately we have not got to that point is um this letter keeps being removed unopened destroyed and replaced (laughs) with a new letter every time we get this new prime minister and i love the idea even though it's a very very frightening situation and i hope we never open the letter and i hope if we do it says don't fire any more nukes um but but i think that's a great example of actually within the 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 modern mechanism of, of of the navy and the submarine and nuclear warfare and prime ministers none of which are particularly spooky um we have this jewel of forbidden knowledge right there at the bottom of the sea Anyway, I think that's enough uh, about... It is. I was going to talk about stuff. the Insole Codex, which is obviously great for Bidnor's territory, but we are out of time. This is, and this, is the, this is the monkey that haunts you. You've mentioned the Insole Codex several times over our episodes, and we always run out of time. So maybe eventually the monkey will catch up with you. Maybe you'll find some sort of redemptive arc which will remove the Insole Codex from your life. It's how monkeys do. Maybe I'll just cut my own throat. Okay, well, that is an awful way. I thought my story was a fun way to end the podcast, and now it's really horrible again. Wish, wish them a spooky day. Have a safe and spooky day. <laughs>